What's the best depth of injection to use? What are the pros and the cons? What are the reasons why sometimes we're deep, sometimes we're superficial, and sometimes we're in between? And that's what we're covering on today's show. I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. Hi, I'm Miranda Pierce. And this is the Aesthetics Mastery Show. So what are the factors that are involved in making the depth decision? So before I answer that, can you give us a like if you're excited to learn with us today on the show? We really appreciate the support. So um, the way I've broken it down is I think there are four factors that dictate uh, the depth that we should be injecting at. And obviously that varies on your intention. But the first is, what are the aesthetic indications? What is it that you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to remove a wrinkle? Are you trying to create some definition? Are you trying to create a curvature? Are we removing a shadow? All of those things play a role in deciding what depth you need to inject. And of course, you can see that quite obviously with a crease, you're going to be more superficial, but maybe with a contour, you're going to be deeper. So that's the aesthetic indication. Uh, the next is the complication risk. So there are parts of the face where you've got structures underneath where you wouldn't dream of sticking a needle. So if you're right above a nerve plexus, you're not going to stick a needle onto the bone because you're going to hit that collection of nerves. Likewise, if you're near an entry point of, an, of the artery into the face, so you might be near the infraorbital artery or perhaps the, uh, the facial artery as it enters over the, over the angle of the jaw. These are areas where going deep onto the periosteum would be very dangerous. And that would be a reason why you would never go deep in those areas. We also have um, the aesthetic indication in terms of how it moves. So if you're at different levels, you'll find that the movement of the face changes how the filler interacts over time. So if you think about trying to emulate bone, for example, so typical example would be maybe the angle of the jaw. So if you're injecting superficially, trying to create a shape that looks like the angle of the jaw, but you're in the superficial fat, you will find that as the as your mouth opens, the filler moves doesn't move with the bone. And then you create an odd look where you can see the shape sitting on top of the structure as it moves. So it's actually a little bit like I have with my beard because I shave along the jawline. If I open my mouth, you'll see that the hair suddenly doesn't, doesn't fit my jawline anymore because the jawline's moved. Now, the, exactly the same thing can happen with filler along the jawline. So that might be a reason why we choose to inject along the periosteum where possible, as long as we're not near the facial artery, of course. And the next uh, indication we need to think about is how efficiently will the job be done? Because I've discovered over time that at different levels of injection, you get a different bang for your buck. And sometimes we're trying to be efficient with product. It may be better to be more superficial, for example. Um, and similarly, intermediate depth, you may lose some of that product. Um, and sometimes it's better to be deeper if you're trying to emulate the structure of bone. So the, these are the four factors. So in summary, there are four key factors that control the depth at which we inject. There is how does it look? Because that's our aesthetic indication. How does it move? So that can also change depending on depth. Um, how efficient is your product getting the job done? And finally, what are the complications that you're risking at, dif at different depths? So what's the best way to break this down? So uh, I thought we, what we could do is work through the different layers of the skin, and then we'll talk about the indications for injecting at each layer, and then the advantages, disadvantages, and of course the risks at each layer. So presumably we're starting with the dermis at the top. Yeah, so injecting the dermis is one of the more common things we do, obviously, because lines and wrinkles, basically that problem uh, is most obvious at the level of the dermis. And if you're gonna try and correct a line or wrinkle, it's worth understanding the anatomy of that wrinkle. And essentially what happens is you you're start by simply folding the dermis, but over time you actually get a decrease in thickness of the reticular layer of the dermis. And so the top layer of the skin gets closer to the layer beneath. Sometimes you can actually see this. If you look at some of the deepest wrinkles and pull them apart, you can actually see a, often a slightly pink line at the bottom of that. And that is showing you that underneath the wrinkle, you've actually got a breakdown of the tissue. It's a much thinner component of the skin. And that's what we're trying to do when we're injecting in the dermis is we're strengthening the skin to prevent the later or subsequent breakdown and thinning of the reticular layer of the dermis. So it's a preventative, but you do need to stop the skin bending at that point. So that's probably the main indication for injecting in the mid to superficial dermis. But there are also other, other times when you might inject there as well, because it's the layer where you get the most amount of traction superficially. So by traction, I mean support. If you imagine bunching together skin, if you, often I do it when I'm examining a patient, you give a little squeeze and you see where the little, the little weak 
points form. There's like a ripple in the surface. If you inject in the dermis, you can resist that. And that is probably the main indication for injecting at that layer is it, it resists gravity and the other force across the face really well at that level of the skin. Can you give us the kind of like areas of the face that, that might be? Any line or wrinkle you might inject there. So, you know, middle labial fold, marionette lines or... Um, the nasal labial fold, if there's a crease, you're going to be superficial. Now, if you're just treating a shadow, that's not going to work. So that's a, that's a very big important distinction about level of injection is that when you're injecting what's a contour or a shadow like nasal labial folds quite often are, there is no point injecting superficially if there is no actual crease. So the indication is most often creases. Um, but you're also at that sort of depth if you're trying to create maybe definition somewhere, particularly the the vermilion border you're also equally very superficial at that point so that there's similar types of layers that you might inject but it's it's basically any line or wrinkle so what are the advantages of injecting here so if you're a superficial you know where you are so you can do a little depth check it's a very very clear simple depth check which you elevate the needle uh, don't seesaw it because that hurts the patient but you lift everything up um, parallel with the surface of the skin and you should see the skin blanch and that will tell you that you're underneath the papillary dermis um, but you're superficial, superficial enough that you're above most of the hypodermis, the fat, and that is a good position to push the skin out, support the skin and decrease the, um, the, the chance of it bending, soften a wrinkle uh, and that's, that's the advantage of injecting at that level. You know where you are, it's, it's usually not that close to most blood vessels so it's a safer place to inject and uh, it's an effective place to inject so long as you're injecting for the right reasons. Disadvantages, probably your next question, is that you're, you're superficial enough that if you use a product that's too thick, you might see it. So lumps, bumps, um, basically, it's not going to hide any mistakes for you. If you put a bit too much in, you're going to see it. You know, the most critical area would be in the tear trough. So if you're injecting there, the dermis is so thin, that a little bit too much, you'll see a slug of the filler and that causes an aesthetic complication. You can see the problem. Um, so that's the disadvantage of that area. In terms of the risks, it is it, ta it does tend to be safer in general, um, but you can be, if you're too superficial, and this is just my theory, but I think if you're above the papillary dermis, that's where the blood supply peaks, you know, it's, it's the highest point of the blood supply supplying the epidermis, you could cause a pressure type necrosis. So this is a very thin area of necrosis that basically just, I've seen a couple of these over the years through the training network that we support, where you get a line of filler that follows the shape of the needle that then causes a small breakdown in tissue, which normally doesn't scar, but it is a, it is a superficial type of necrosis, which I think is akin to a pressure sore from compressing the capillaries on the uh, papillary dermis. And that's from being a bit too superficial. The way that you know about that is that you when you're injecting, before you do your depth check, you see a gray color to the needle. You've already squeezed the blood out of the tissue and it doesn't matter how neutral your force across the needle is, you see that white area of the needle. You're basically seeing the color of the needle with no blood above it and that is too superficial. What about the Tyndall effect? Yeah, so that would also be something that you get as well. So um, if, you, if you inject at that level, you're above most of what would hide the filler and injecting too superficially or too much in the in the superficial plane will cause the Tyndall effect. All the Tyndall effect is is basically that the the filler ref, refracts light differently to skin, and you you're just seeing the the slight blue tint that you get with almost all fillers, but some are worse than others, um, so that you're actually seeing the filler instead of seeing tissue. The problems you're describing with the being too superficial do they apply to all fillers? So the the firmer your product, the higher the G prime, the less tolerant is going to be of a superficial injection. And that, what that means is you'll be able to see the shape of the product because um, what a very low viscosity pr product or an uncross -link, link product just basically oozes between all those ret retinacular fibers and it and it's, forms a nice sheet. Whereas if, if it's thicker, it holds itself together more and you'll see the shape. Now, um, with intermediate thickness fillers, and th this happened to me when I first started injecting, as I was told, you can use them for both those lines. And with a with a good experienced hand, you can. But you know, when you're a new injector, you tend to basically have a little bit less finesse. And I remember um, finding a couple of patients being able to see not when they were static, but when they would do certain movements, they would they would perceive that superficial nature of it. So we have to use products that are very good for superficial uh, lines where they, the manufacturer recommends using them at, la at that level 
or if you've got five years of experience and you're good at, uh, at spreading it, there's a bit of leeway, but as a general rule, um, we use the, the, the exactly the product that the manufacturer recommends. So what we've covered there is the dermis, the papillary dermis, and the retinacular cutis. Those are the top three layers. Uh, what's the next layer? Hypodermis. Very good. So <laughs> hypodermis. What are the advantages of injecting in the hypodermis? So this is the uh, an easier plane to pass things like a cannula. You, you simply effectively can't inject in the dermis with a cannula. You'll always scoop beneath. So a lot of the kind of shadows, um, maybe some of the, the curvatures we're correcting when you're more superficial is in the hypodermis. Good things about injecting here is you're probably, if you're with a cannula, you're going to be slightly above the arteries. Um, but you're getting much closer to them um, and you're you're going to have a, an easier path with a cannula than when you're deeper. So those are those are the main advantages. The indications would be really that you're, you're normally treating curvatures or adding a little bit of additional structure. It's not the main place that you're providing structure and contour. That's usually deeper, uh, but you can do it. And, and Probably the most common reason I inject here is because you're too afraid of what's underneath. So it's jawline work when you're when you're above, for example, the the facial artery, you're unlikely to be injecting deep over there. Same with underneath the zygoma. If you're ever filling that area, you tend to be more superficial in the hypodermis. Any risks of injecting in the hypodermis? So there are certain parts of the face where the arteries tend to gravitate to intermediate layers. So the, the most common that you're likely to come across would be the facial artery when you're injecting the nasolabial fold. It is quite often on the, the deep side of, of the hypodermis. And, and that means if you're injecting over here and you're in, at intermediate depth, then obviously you may cause a vascular occlusion. So that's why a lot of people use the deep periosteal injection in at that position. Um, so that's that's the main one I think about. But it, it's normally most of the arteries are not. You know, if you're injecting in most areas, you've got to be on the deeper side anyway. Um, but you you'd be thinking along those lines at certain areas of the face when you're injecting. So I think we have the SMAS next. Yes, yeah, so the SMAS is a very important layer for supporting structures. But now we never actually directly try and inject into the SMAS, but we're often thinking about, are we above or beneath it? So as a rough rule of thumb, above the SMAS, hypodermis, beneath the SMAS is the deep fat pads. Um, and it's very important if you're thinking about lifting using the ligaments. So particularly with cheek treatments, you want to be underneath the, underneath the SMAS. Uh, a lot of the treatments that we do where you're trying to create structure are indirectly lifting tissue um, like we discussed in our ligament video, which we'll link down below, um, that when you support the ligaments by injecting beneath the SMAS, you, you have a lifting effect in theory. Uh, and that's the main thing to know about the SMAS, which is that it's, it's, you're going to be better at lifting if you're beneath the, the SMAS. And especially with your knowledge of, of ligaments, you should be directly thinking about those structures when you're adding volume at that level. So generally with the SMAS, you're injecting below it, which you need to be aware of it. Tell us about the advantages of the deep fat pads, the next one down. So the, the main advantages of injecting in the deep fat pad, well, it, relating to the SMAS also, is it's, it's a much more forgiving place to inject aesthetically because you're, 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 under, you're covered by the SMAS. So if you're in the deep fat pad and you create a little bit of projection, um, you're not going to see the shapes and contours of the individual blobs of filler. Like you're, you're just going to see a general lift in that direction. So it's aesthetically very forgiving. Um, another really key advantage is for, for many of the blood vessels, what we're often doing is injecting on the periosteum with a needle. Um, and, and that means that you're further away in certain places. Uh, most of the face, in fact, you're further away from the arteries. So, so long as you aren't near the foramen uh, where the arteries enter the face, um, if, you're, if you're injecting in the deep fat pad, that is a, a nice place to inject in terms of decrease in risk from vascular occlusion, um, but also this, the, it is a good place to create contouring, um, which is what we're doing mostly for chin, jawline, cheek treatments. And finally, the bottom, the bone, the periosteum, what are the advantages of injecting here? So, I mean, the nice thing about the, if you're intending to inject on the periosteum is you know exactly when you're at that level because you actually feel the needle touch it. Um, and that has uh, is a very reassuring place to inject in certain areas of the face and a very risky place, and well, a scary place that you wouldn't inject when you know your anatomy um, if you're in the wrong place. So um, it's, it's essentially um, the most stable place to inject as well. So I think aesthetically, so jawlines are an excellent example of this. And I've now seen a, a case come up on our complications group where someone who did cannula with jawline, which is very common, the patient complained that when she moved, as we've already discussed, that she could see the filler sitting on top as she opened her mouth and she didn't like that effect. When she's still in a photograph, she looks great, 
but the movement um, revealed the depth of the product. So that is an, a reason to inject on the periosteum, particularly with chins and jaw lines. If you want the movement to look natural, injecting on the periosteum is probably a much better place to inject. Um, but of course, you've got to know the anatomy and avoid the facial artery. But that, that's probably one of the biggest benefits is I think you create a more stable structure. Everything else sits on top of it and you don't have this movement. So if you think about what's happening with all the fat pads, as we covered in our ligament video, they're sliding on top of each other in this structure. And the, the more superficial you get, uh, even in the deep fat pad, if you're at the top end of it, the filler is going to be mo more mobile. So the deeper you get, the stiller it should be in most movements. And therefore, maybe the longer it lasts, the less chance of migration. And I think that's probably the most important thing to know about injecting on the periosteum is, is in terms of that stability long term. We also have a great video on where not to inject deep. Yeah. So we'll link that in the description as well. Yeah, and that's probably the biggest risk to know is you need to know your entry points, or five entry points uh, of arteries into the face. Uh, they're basically centered around the, mainly the foramen, so your supratrochlear, supraorbital, uh, uh, infraorbital, mental, um, what are the others, facial artery. Um, all of those entry points, as the artery comes into the face, it tends to be on the bone. Uh, and obviously those are the places where you would never inject on the periosteum. So how are we supposed to know how deep we are when we can't see? So depth check is the most important thing you can do. So um, now you've, you've got to know a little bit about the, the type of skin you're injecting. So there's big differences in the thickness of the skin. If you're injecting the tear trough, firstly, there are fewer layers, there are three layers in the tear trough, for example, but also it's only 0.2 millimeters thick, the dermis. So it can look like you're very, very superficial, but you are still under the dermis. You're not in the, in the epidermis, for example, even though you're so superficial because the skin is thinner. So you need to know the skin and there's different thicknesses. So chins are very thick, the labella is a very thick place to inject, uh, and that might change what you see. But essentially it's about a depth check, um, that blanching thing which I described mm. earlier when you see the, the, you see it blanch. If you want to be in the hypodermis, um, then when you lift, you should just see all the tissue lift, but not, not a clear line of blanching in most of the face. So t typical would be you know, a, a crease on your cheek, for example. Um, if, you're, if you want to be inflating the volume of a superficial cheek fat pad a little bit. Um, when you lift up, it shouldn't be clear where the needle is. You should just see the shape of the needle and maybe slight blanching, but it shouldn't be clear at all. When you're more superficial, much clearer where the needle is and where the blanching is. And if you're too superficial, there's continuous blanching. It doesn't change at all. Um, no matter what you do with your needle, it's it's white, but it's also a very small area of white, Just just basically following the shape of the needle. And of course, if you're on the periosteum, you know that because you can feel it, it's hard. So I hope that helped you refresh some of the concepts and your anatomy. Um, if you want to download a free guide to where not to inject too deeply, we have that linked down below. Um, and don't forget to like if you found that helpful and subscribe to the channel and we will see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.